you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, the fifth chapter. I had something else in another direction that I was going, but all week long the Lord kept bringing me back to this. And I really I feel like God wants to speak this to us today. The name and the title of my message is very simple. If you want to write it in on the back of the bulletin, uh, the, the title of it is just simply this, Healing Hate. We live in a world full of hatred. Hatred for so many things, hatred on so many levels. We, seen, we have seen the violence that t- took place this week in, in El Paso and Daytona, or, or Dayton, Ohio. We see all of, the, all of the, the offenses that seem to be going around the, the world today. And it, life seems to be taken so easily with, with, uh, without, without a thought. We'll go in and kill several people who are just at the wrong place, it seems like, at the wrong time. We live in a world that's turned up down and the measure of life seems to be such an extent that it doesn't seem to be anything significant to see someone go through a rampage of killing. But I looked at this and I began to talk about the idea of what it means to hate and what it means. And and so I, I looked up the actual definition of the word hate. It says an intense hostility and aversion usually deriving from fear or anger or a sense of injury, an extreme dislike or disgust in apathy towards. I I looked at that idea and I began to look at the idea because there's, see, there's a lot of things that, that I hate. There are some things that I hate. I hate sauerkraut. Now that's not a strong dislike, Don. That's a hate. I hate sauerkraut. I hate snakes. That's not a strong dislike. I hate snakes. You know, I don't really, I dislike my mice. But, but I can tolerate. And, and that one that we killed, Alejandro, was so cute. It has his little eyes was so cute this morning. And then when he smashed it with the broom and it just it it was still kicking. And he said, I've got to suffocate this thing and kill it all the way out. You know, I got to I was thinking, poor little Mickey. <laughs> but after that, my wife thought Alejandro was the greatest person in the world because he killed a mouse. But there are di- there's a difference between a dislike and a hate. There's a difference between it. And a lot of times we dislike things. Like we may, you may dislike a certain kind of food or a certain type of, of atmosphere or a ter- certain type of... You may dislike the heat. Anybody with me on that? You're getting, I, I, sometimes I, I walk out. But I, I dislike cold weather. I, I don't hate cold weather. But I'm going to tell you, the older I get, the more I dislike it. Because my bones hurt when I'm in cold weather. My wife and my mother-in-law seem to think that we have to have the house at a freezing point before it, we survive the summer. And uh, when, I, when I am home, I push the thermometer up and take that thermostat up. And then all of a sudden, I'll sit down in my recliner and I'll feel cold air. And I know one of those two has gotten into the, into the thermostat again and put it back down and then I go back up and go back down. That poor thermostat's going to be worn out before the summer's over. But to dislike and, and, and to hate, it can be seen as a, a, a continuum where, where hate is more of an extreme and a stronger emotion than dislike. Hate is defined by, by disliking something, by, by being more intense or passionate uh, about what you dislike. It's taking disliking something to a different extreme. We live in a world where if it doesn't fit our, our like, if we don't see it as what we want, if it's different than the normal, we begin to dislike it. And it's not very long before Satan will run it into a hatred mode. And things begin, they slide into it so easily. Oftentimes we see that the word hate being more an intense uh, emotion like that. But in law, we oftentimes see that that, 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 that in other situations there is a significant difference between disliking someone and hating someone. Have you, uh, there, there's, there, believe it or not, there's not a crime for disliking someone. And I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm talking about you can dislike someone without hating them. But I will tell you this, if you dislike them strong enough, it will turn into hate. 
And we live in a world that seems to be so significant when, when you can take 29 lives and kill them just because you don't like the color of their skin and you don't like where they came from. There's a problem in the world today. And, and, and you can argue with me all day long. It's not a gun problem. It's a hate problem we have in this world. And, and, and we, when it comes down to it, that's the real issue that we need to see. Now, how can we heal this hatred that seems to be running the world? I believe we've got to look at some scripture to begin to bring this up. And so, um, Alejandro, if you'll go ahead. And, uh, the world today that we live in. Matthew, the 24th chapter, gives us a description. It's a window picture painted by Jesus of of the world that we live in. In a futuristic passage, Jesus begins to teach about this is what's going to happen in the future. And in the ninth chapter, in verse 24, it says, And and they will deliver you up into tribulation and kill you, and, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And we know that that scripture right there refers to Jews in Jerusalem. It refers to the Jews that were persecuted during the Holocaust. But here's the next scripture that talks about it, and it says that many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. That particular section of scripture is not just written to the Jew, but it's to any believer that you will be hated because you believe. And the sad thing is, is we, not even in the body of Christ, have learned to heal this scripture. There's, there's bitterness and anger. We speak out of, of, a, of a frustration. And the, and the love of God does not abide the way it should be in the church. I'll tell you how far this extreme work of the, of the enemy has happened. We, we, we don't, I, I believe this with all my heart. This was something that I saw online and I couldn't believe it when I saw it. But this is a toy. These are toys. And it's, an, it's a toy that represents an angry mob. Now, why would you want, this is for kids that are 12 and under. Why would you want a 12-year-old? Because I will tell you something. Hatred and hate is something that's trained in you. It is a trained emotional reaction and a behavior. You learn to hate. And, and you, you, are, you are trained that it comes up in your upbringing. Uh, when my mother was, was uh, raised in the South, and, and a lot of times she struggles with that. My father-in-law, uh, a lot of times he would tease about it. But, but I can tell you this, that it didn't come. And my, my children and my grandchildren, uh, when I look at them, I don't see that in them. And I pray that they never get taught that mentality to learn to hate. You know why I hate sauerkraut? Because it's sour. Thank you, Jamie. It's rotten cabbage. Why in the world would you want to eat anything rotten? Would you eat it? No way. I wouldn't either. But I tried it one time because my grandfather said it was the best food on the earth. And he loved it. And you may like it. I know Chris is shaking her head. She, oh, she's told me before, you just need to have it fixed right. And I don't want to fix it anyway. I tried it, I ate it, and the smell of it made me get sick. But my grandfather said, you got to eat it. And so I ate it, and I got sick, and I threw up, and I said, I will never eat sauerkraut again. I don't even like the smell of sauerkraut. You know what my wife does when she's mad at me, Brother Farr? When she's mad at me, she will open a can of sauerkraut and start eating it in the couch right beside me. Just to torment me. I hate cabbage, and I have a strong like or dislike for my wife when she eats sauerkraut beside me. I, but I'll get over that one. I, I love her in spite of that. But how, how can this be acceptable in the world that we live in? That's why there's hatred. Because we have a prejudice against things that we are afraid of or we don't know anything about. I can tell you this. And I, I, will, I, I'm, I was going to say this a little bit later in my message, but I can tell you this. There are good in every color, and there are bad in every color. I don't care. If you stereotype, all you are doing is alienating the ones that could be a, a blessing and a good friend to you. Amen? 
Sometimes we, we look at someone and because they're, they're different than we are, we, we want to alienate them and we think, well, they ought to be this or they ought to be that. I'm going to tell you something. The world needs to understand that we are drawn together by the love of God. And the only way that I know, the only way that I know to get through that is to see the love of God in the church again. Do you know that the church and a group of good old church folks started the KKK? Based on the hatred of somebody that was a different color than they thought they ought to be. Come on. I'm not here bashing or talking about anybody, but I'm going to tell you something. When we uh, alienate ourselves and we begin to say we're better than somebody else, we are missing the point. God sent his son to die for every human being of every color and nation. Now, I'm talking about healing not only outside of the church, but in the church. It needs to change. We need to change. I don't believe heaven will have a, uh, a section over here for this group and this group and this group. I, I, told, I was telling somebody the other day, heaven is going to be a beautiful place. And the reason that, that, that I think it's going to be beautiful is because it's going to be so colorful if all of us are there. But the second thing that's going to make it beautiful is that we're all going to be able to have the same language. And I was telling a pastor that, and I said, it's going to be so beautiful. We're all going to be speaking the same language. And he goes, I know you'll learn Spanish then. <laughs> of course, he was a Spanish pastor, and he thought he was really funny. I believe that if you'll look at it with me, in the chapter 5 of Matthew, we realize and recognize how to heal hate. And Jesus gives us uh, this portrayal uh, of his message on the Sermon on the Mount. There are so many things that he teaches us about how that we as believers should be acting and living in a world that, that he has left us to reach. He has left us to share the gospel message with everyone that we meet. And he, we are here today for that purpose. That's why the church is here. To represent Christ in a world that needs a Savior. When I look at that, I begin to skim down through there. And I was drawn to several places in the, in, throughout this text and throughout this scripture. But in, in, particularly in this fifth chapter in the 43rd verse. And I'm going to read down through the 48th verse. So if you'll stay with me. It's up here on the screen if you didn't bring your Bibles. It says, you have heard that it was said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? No, no tax collectors in here today. Okay, okay. And if you greet your brother and only, what do you, uh, what do, you do more than, in, than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I want to share with you a little bit, taking this passage of scripture just a, a little bit further and realizing the idea of what he speaks to us you see the first thing that i believe if we're going to see this land healed if we're going to see the church improve if we're going to see things turn around we have got to realize the first thing that he tells us is that we must learn to love now we think that a lot of times we read this scripture and and this was thrown out believe it or not this was a, a scripture Go ahead and pull that next one up. This was a scripture that a group used for their hate. Hold on, you're too far, too fast. He says, you who love the Lord hate evil. And so they took that as their battle cry, and they wanted to go out and slaughter anything. You see, the word evil could be represented and translated as anything of sin. And they wanted to destroy anything that was sinful. I'm going to tell you something. God loves the sinner. 
God just doesn't love the saint. He loves the sinner. He sent his son to die on a cross for whosoever. He didn't send him just to to die for the perfect or the church or or, or, or those that are saved. He sent him to die uh, for the lost. Amen? And we need to understand that if we are going to do what the church is, is called to do, then we've got to learn to love like Jesus loves. We can hate evil and still love the Lord. Amen? This is my... Write this down and get this in your spirit. God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Did you hear that? God hates sin... But he loves the sinner. Now that may be hard for you to decipher between, but I'm going to tell you something. I know that when I was living in sin, and I know that sin became a part of my lifestyle and part of my life, I knew that I was separate from God, and sin separated me from the love of God. But I know that when I surrendered my heart and totally committed my life to Him and said, Lord, I will serve you, I will follow you, I want, and then the Lord began to shine upon my life, and I began to realize a newness of His love. But my sin separated me. It was never that God stopped loving me, but my sin separated me from God's love. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't that God didn't love. God is love. That's what it says in 1 John 4. He says that God is love. And it says, he that doesn't love is not of God. For God is love. Amen? For some of you, I'm, I'm giving you a quick flashback. So, how many of you were born and you were alive during the 70s? Raise your hands. Some of you are lying. Amen. No, I'm just kidding. If you were, how many of you remember how that they, we did love and peace? But do you know that that was one of the most radically hated, bitter enemies that one of the one of the hardest things in the world at that time they sang and talked of love they talked of peace they talked of that but yet we were extremely uh, uh, racist at that time parties were were described in such a way that they would go to war against each other even in their own continent in their own country groups were divided and made apart when they had a whole theme of a, a whole generation was love peace and joy I still have the pants to prove it. I can't wear them anymore. They were the bell bottoms, you know, the big ones that had the whole thing in it. And I love on one pocket, joy on the other. And, you know, I was, it was really cool. Mark, you don't have to nod your head like that and roll your eyes. I know. But if we're going to truly see the healing of, of, of hate, then the first thing we must realize is that we must learn to love like Jesus loves. We must learn to love. Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't look you up and down and decide, uh, well, I don't really like you? Because I I don't don't like you because you don't don't fit that perfect mold. You made a mistake a long time ago, so now I don't like you. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't do that? Aren't you glad that he looked beyond, beyond your past and he loved you? And he looked beyond your mistakes and he looks beyond that today and loves you in spite of who you were and what you did? And his love draws you out of those things. It draws you out from the, from the, the hatred and the bitterness. It draws you out of the sin. You see, because as long as there is bitterness and hatred in your heart, it will drive you to sin. It will convince you that wrong is right. That's exactly what hatred does. It begins to create the opportunity when when you think that you're justified because you can do something because this is this way or this is that way. Hate, um, Hate the sin and love the sinner is what Jesus did. From the cross, he spoke these words. He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. The very passage gives us the idea that Jesus knew that we would be caught up in our own life. We must learn then, secondly, not only to love like Jesus, but we must learn to forgive and forget. I'm going to meddle for just a little bit in this section. Because I believe that you need to learn to forgive and forget. Because... 
Somewhere in your life, if there is hatred against a color or a person or a nationality, it's because you have learned that trait somewhere in your life. You have begotten angry. And you stereotype a, a person or a people because of that in your life. Something from your past has drove you to that place. It's brought you to the, the place to where you, you, you don't let things go. You become bitter. You become angry. And it dwells within you. It burns within you. It eats you up. It consumes you. And it will drive you away from the love of God. Listen to what it says in Matthew, the fifth chapter. It says, but you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you uh, not to resist an evil person. But whosoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other also. If I was brave enough, I'd let you come up here and slap me. You got your hand all ready. Look at him. He's already ready to do it. And then I say, okay, turn and do the other cheek. But let me do it to you first. He said, no, I ain't doing that. I ain't crazy. Here's what happens. And here's what, here's what we begin to realize is that, that Peter went to, to Jesus and began to ask him, how many times do I have to forgive someone? And, and Jesus begins to go through this whole lesson with Peter about the, the opportunity to forgive and, and what it means to forgive. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, he begins to teach him about this process of forgiving. We realize that turning the other cheek is not easy. Get even. Get justification. They did you wrong. You need to do them just a little worse. Come on. You know I'm on metal. We do this when we drive our car. How many of you, when somebody turns and cuts you off, you want to get in front of them and cut them off? Come on. Ben, thank you for your honesty. We'll have an altar call in just a little bit. He was too enthusiastic when he raised his hand. Some of you, when somebody, I, I mean, here, here's what happens. I, I never will forget this story. I was told this story, and I, I crack up every time I think about it. But there was a guy that he, he was driving his car, and, and, and he was in traffic, and, and all of a sudden, somebody from behind him started honking, honking his horn. And he was getting madder by the minute. The more that he, the, the car behind him honked his horn, the madder he got. He finally got it to a light, and there was the car, guy was just honking and honking, and, and, and he gets out of his car, slams, and he walks back there, and he says, why are you honking at me? Did I wake everybody up there? Good. He said, why are you honking at me? He said, well, you got a bumper sticker on that says, if you love Jesus, to honk. And so I was just honking, telling you, I love Jesus. How much you know that he felt like he could crawl under the car right then? He, I'm sure he probably looked at him and said, well, I was just making sure you were okay. I thought maybe you needed prayer at that point. Come on, we can jump into spirituality real quick. When, when we see this, we begin to realize the necessity of learning to forgive. Go ahead and pull that next one up. In Matthew, the 18th chapter, when Jesus talks to Peter, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but I say up to 70 times seven. 70 times seven. Now, I heard it talked about this way. And for those of you, if you're married today, if you're just in a, in a relationship or maybe however you want to put it. And then Peter, I'll just change the phrase just a little bit. I'm not changing the scripture. Don't alienate me for this. But he, Lord, how often shall I forgive my husband when he sins? Shall I forgive him seven times? Make sure my wife watches this later. Uh, Jesus said to him, do not say that you only forgive him seven times, but you must forgive him 70 times seven. I never will forget one time in marriage counseling, Eric. I was talking to a couple, and, and a lady brought this. I said, you need to forgive. And she said, Pastor, I don't know if I can forgive. And, and I said, well, the Bible says you must, must forgive them 70 times seven. And she said, I don't know if my calculator works that well.
Jesus wasn't trying to say there's a number. Uh, to What he was saying is, is you need to learn to forgive greater than you really are. Bigger than you intend to. Forgive. It'll tear your home. It'll tear your relationship apart. It'll tear your life apart. If you let unforgiveness set in your heart, it will hinder your prayer life. It will hinder your relationship with God and your effectiveness for Him in the kingdom. Jesus dropped down a few verses in Matthew, the 18th chapter, and verse 35, and He said, So, Heavenly Father, uh, so my Heavenly Father also will do uh, to to you if you uh, from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. And Jesus speaking there about the idea of the unjust servant who was forgiven by his master. And then because he fell down and he started begging, he said, Master, forgive my debt. I can't pay you back. And finally the master said, I will forgive you. Go on. You're forgiven. And then he went, this servant that was forgiven, went out and he started grabbing the, another servant that owed him money and he started strangling him, if you will, and then put him into the punishment and he said, you owe me, now you pay up. And he didn't have unforgiveness. Sometimes we want forgiveness, but we don't want to forgive. Come on. We want, we want forgiveness, But we don't want to forgive. Forgiveness happens. It doesn't happen uh, by accident. It happens intentionally. When you forgive, it's an intentional effort on your part to let something go. Look what it says in Mark, the 11th chapter. One more, Alejandro. It says, Mark 11. He says in verse 25, And whenever you stand up praying, if you have anything against anyone... If you have anything against anyone, did did, did you get that? Let me say that one more time. If you have anything against anyone, what's that say up there? It says, forgive him that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your heavenly father forgive your trespasses. Wow. If I don't, if if not not only do I have to learn to love, but I have to learn to forgive because unforgiveness will hinder every part of my relationship with God. It will ruin my prayer life. Come on, if you're struggling with with receiving an answer in your prayer life and you're struggling about it and you're struggling to receive something from God, maybe you need to look and see if there's unforgiveness in your life. This is good preaching, whether you like it or not. Thirdly, I believe that you've got to love beyond you and yours. You've got to learn to love others beyond your own circle. You've got to learn to understand that, God, it's not just about you. Amen? I know that we live in an I generation, and we live in a a generation that's so stuck on me. iPhones. That is my phone, and that is it. It's an iPhone. I told my grandson that the other day. He goes, Papa, can I use your phone to play some games? I said, that's an iPhone. It's a me phone. It's a my phone. It's a not a your phone. <laughs> I know, some of, you, some of that went right over some of your head. You can watch the recording later, but... You got to understand that it's not about just about you and just about the, the situation that you're in. The problem with the world is, is that we get so caught up in our little circle that we forget what's going on around us. There's a bigger picture being painted by God. And the church, if we're going to make a difference, we must see the bigger picture. Jesus wanted to send us to change the world. But oftentimes we get so caught up in us and me that we forget what he really wants us to do. In verse 46 and 47 of my text in in Matthew, it says, For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do the more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. 
You see, here's what the problem is. We get so isolated in our little circles. We, we don't like to get out of our comfort zone to go anywhere else, to do anything else. Come on, amen? We're drawn by our culture, and it's oftentimes hard to get out of it. Amen? Now, it's going to be hard for some of you to relate to. But have you ever been, felt isolated when you walk into a room where people don't look like you? You ever felt that way? I never will forget the first time that uh, I was pastoring here and I was invited to go to a wedding and I didn't have to do the wedding and, and they said there was going to be free food so I, as long as there's not sauerkraut, I was going. They invited me to go and it was a Hispanic wedding and, and they, they did everything and I walked in and I promise you I was the only person that wasn't Hispanic in the room. And they did the whole service in Spanish and I didn't hear, I didn't understand a word they said. I knew the process. When they kissed at the end, I was close to the cake. That's all I knew. And sometimes we get caught up in our circles. Come on. We live in our little sections because we feel comfortable in our own little umbrella of our world. But you know what? God calls us to reach a lost and dying world. And it doesn't matter the color of their skin. They need Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being used by God to go and to do what God has called you to do. Amen? Amen. And, it, and when we realize the difference that God makes us to be, then we must realize that it's important for us to see the need of, of a generation that, 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 that is cross-cultural and, and, and cross... Well, listen, we, we live in a generation... Come on, sometimes we don't even... We, we live in a stereotype of our world. Some of our senior adults are afraid of hanging around teenagers. <laughs> I mean, saying, yep, we do. I've already had an amen on this side, so we're just ignoring that. Some of us, sometimes because they're different, they dress different. Come on. My son Joey said, Dad, you need to dress a little cooler. I said, it's about as cool as I get, Joe. And, and he, he, he was telling me because we were going to his school to, to meet the principal and all this stuff when they were getting ready to start school. And, and he told me, he said, Dad, you, you need to dress a little cooler. I looked at me and I said, as good as you get, son. I don't know what the definition of what, what is different about it. And I, I, so come on. As they get older and, and, and the generations change, come here. Come on. We, we, generations are different. Can you tell anything different about us? <laughs> I think it might be just the haircut. <laughs> Get out of here, you rat. We cling to who we, we like and who we look like. Come here, Brother Bledsoe. Come here. Come here. I need you to come up here for a minute. He says forget. We, when, you, when you're at church and you wear a tie and you cling with those who wear ties. <laughs> Martin says, I ain't wearing no tie. I don't care what you say. When, when, we, when you, we get into a culture where we like it because we all dress alike and we all look alike and we all wear this stereotype, I'm going to tell you something. I believe that when God starts moving and revival truly comes to the church, it will be a different look than we've ever believed it. It will be different than we've ever dreamed it. People are going to come in that are not going to look different than we do. They're not going to look like the typical church person. Now, there's nothing wrong with typical church people. Thank God for that. Amen? Amen. And, and, and so here, here's the, the, the hard thing is, is that there's going to be people, though, that are different. And if we alienate from them, what are they going to feel? We don't love them. We don't want them. It, it, I, I know that there was, there was a pastor friend of mine, and, well, 
he used to sit in the parking lot, and I won't say his name because Stella knows him, but when the car would come into the parking lot, he would judge the value of the person based upon the cost of their car. And it would determine whether he would go get them and meet them or whether he would send somebody else from the staff to go meet them. And a lot of times he would look out over that congregation and he would judge them and he would, he would look at them and he would say, well, they're driving a brand new Mercedes. And then he would see somebody drive in with the 71 Gremlin and he would say, they're not worth too much. You know what the shame of that is? Most of the time, the person driving the brand new Mercedes is so far in debt that he couldn't tithe if he had to. And the guy, guy driving the 71 Gremlin is probably afraid of parking by some of you in the parking lot, so he drives his old beater. Am I okay with this? Because, I mean, I just got real quiet here, you know? It's almost like somebody just took the air and went... Because here's what happens is you don't know the case of who it is. And if you love only on the externals of what you see, you do not love them. You are loving what you see and you are stereotyping what you see. If we are going to love the world, then we have got to look beyond the external and love them for the love of God that's on them. When we realize that, we will break this stronghold of hatred. We will stereotype it by the, by the style that they are, by the way that they look. We cling to it. We run to it. We are afraid of, of, of things that we don't understand. But sometimes because they look different, they act different. Last night it was really funny. Uh, Martin, I got a lot of videos made of me. Um, because I was into it last night wholeheartedly. I mean, I was, I was into uh, Stephen Bush and the Burning Bush concert. I was doing this stuff, and I, he said, do this, and I was doing this, and I was doing, and, I, and then I got home, and I said, man, that was so cool, Joe, wasn't it? It was so cool, and Joe said, Dad, look, I put this up. Everybody's cracking up. <laughs> what I looked like was an old, fat, man trying to fit in with a bunch of teenagers. Quit laughing. I'm going to shave him bald-headed on Manny. Next time he start with the top shaving it. I'm going to sh- listen to me. We got to love beyond the externals and we got to love like Christ. When we see someone, we love them with the eyes of Christ. You see, Christ didn't look at you and say, well, you're not worth it. He looked at you and said, I love you because you were worthy. You were worth his death so that you could be saved. Not because of your money or, or because of your status in life. Not because of where you come from or who you are. You are worthy of his love because he said, whosoever. He sent his son to die for whosoever would believe in him. The nature of that, go on, let's pull that next one up. James says this. James says if, in chapter 2 and verse 8, I've been really chewing on this chapter a lot. And it says if you, if you really fulfill the, the royal law of the scripture, and this is what Jesus taught them, which is the, the second of the two commandments that he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He says you do well, but if you show partiality, you know what that is? You know what that word partiality means? It it, it means that I stereotype someone. If I show partiality to someone and and, 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 and you commit a sin. Did did anybody else see that or did we just kind of skip over that? And he says, "And, and, and are convicted by the laws as transgressions. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. 
What he's saying there is if you do not love your neighbor as yourself, you are committing a sin. Now the question was asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor? Everyone in this world is my neighbor. And if I show partiality, if I show the preference of, of over someone because of a particular point in their life, I am showing that. Listen, if we can learn to love beyond the differences, we will see God change the world. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Do you, do you believe that? Jesus loves you. I, 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 I'm about to finish. Roberto, if you come and get ready. We've got to have the help of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. Tonight I'm going to finish this series and this message about how to pray Pray for a lost world. We must, we must have the help of the Lord to love the world. Jesus tells us this in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We don't need a church that points out the faults of the world. We need a church that loves like Jesus. That loves like Jesus. I love it. I love to see our, when I see generations mingle. I, I love it when Brother Farr, I know he, he loads his pockets on Sunday mornings just so the kids will come running up to him. They get candy from him. That's cool because what he's saying is, I got something I want to share with you. And our kids have learned not to be afraid of an old man that might bite their fingers. They're learning that he can love them and he loves them. And, and, and here's the thing. Sometimes we've got to realize that it, there's nothing wrong with it. Like last night, it, believe it or not, even though it wasn't your style, you could still get into it. And there was so much to be said about what God is bringing to. And when, when I was there, I just began to say, I, I love it when, when, when one of our seniors takes a, a young person by, by the arm and says, let me talk to you. Let me, let me share with you. They're hurting. Believe it or not, sometimes kids, you make our day when you tell us we look good. When you tell us we're, we're okay, when we're cool. I know you're being sarcastic when you say, Pastor, I love your hairdo. But hey, it's coming in style now, Martin. Shave your head and do it right, man. Here's the thing. If we're going to love the world, we've got to love beyond the color scheme. We've got to love beyond the age. We've got to love like Christ loved. For God so loved the world that he gave. And in the same way that God loved us, we must learn to love others.